done with inflammation, guys. We're on fluid and hemodynamics. Hope you had good renal fizz. If you, very important. I put a lot of my renal fizz notes in the physiology high yield. So if you're weak on it, that will make you strong. Weak on immunology, just taking a look on the high yields microbiology. I took the best of my immunology kind of notes that I'd make for myself and I stuck them in there. Everything about HIV you need to know is there. Okay, everything that's on boards, it's all still there. So high yield, very important for you. The kind of like uh, the clinical aspects of some of the things that you learned that we don't have enough time in pathology to cover all of those as well. First thing I'm going to do is going to play a little game here between transidate, exudate, increased vessel permeability, and lipedema. So the term that we're going to be using here and, uh, and defining is edema. What is it? It's excess fluid in the interstitial space. So what compartment is that? Extracellular or intracellular? Extracellular. Is it within a vessel or outside a vessel? Outside the vessel. That's the interstitial space, and it's excess fluid in there. That's called edema. Now, some uh, edema is pitting, some edema is non-pitting, okay? Which one pits? Does increased vessel permeability with pus in the interstitial space, which is edema, does that pit? No, okay? Would um, fluid, a transidate, someone with right heart failure, uh, you see the swelling of the lower extremities, is fluid in the interstitial space there, would that pit? Yes. So exudates don't pit, transidates do pit. How about lymphatic fluid? You block the lymphatics and there's lymphatic fluid in your interstitial space. Does that pit? Early on it does, but after a while, no. So basically it's non-pitting. So the three, the, the three things that, that produce edema are transidates, exudates, and lipedema. Those are fluids in the interstitial space. It's only the transudates that can produce pitting edema. The other ones are non-pitting. Now let's talk about transudates because they deal with Starling's forces. This guy Starling must have been important because it's the same dude that did Frank Starling, that Paso will teach you uh, when he comes back to teach his cardiovascular next Monday, a week from today, because of that feigned sickness he had. Okay, and he will teach you about. Frank Starling. That Starling is the same one that produces Starling's forces, which talks about those forces that keep fluids in uh, our blood vessels uh, and those things that try to push it out. What keeps fluids in our blood vessels? Albumin. We call that oncotic pressure. So 80% of the oncotic pressure is related to our serum albumin concentration. So anytime we have hypoalbuminemia, then we would have leaking of a transidate, a protein poor less than three gram per deciliter, uh, cell poor fluid, probably through capillaries and venules that just leak out into the interstitial space, and that would be pitting edema. Now, what's normally in our vessels trying to push fluid out? Hydrostatic pressure. Okay, so who's normally winning in a normal person uh, in, in our blood vessels? Oncotic pressure is winning over hydrostatic pressure, or we would all be squishing our way down these stairs with dependent pitting edema, which mainly would be in your butts uh, from sitting here all that time. Okay, of course, if you did yoga, it would be in your head. Okay, whatever is parts dependent gets, gets the fluid. Okay, that's all I can tell you. So what could produce transidate, protein-poor, cell-poor fluid on our interstitial space? A decrease in oncotic pressure, and an increase in hydrostatic pressure. That's the concept. We're with each other. Yes or no? Okay. Let's brainstorm albumin. Okay? Where's it made? Liver. So you think if you had chronic liver disease, you'd have low albumin. Yes or no? So there's one cause. Okay? Can we get rid of it in any part of our body? Just think of all your orifices. Can you vomit it out in significant amounts? No. Nah. Can you poo it out? Sure. It's called malabsorption. Can you pee it out? Sure, it's called nephrotic syndrome. Can it come off our skin? Sure, third degree burn, basically lose plasma. Okay, what's another possibility for low protein count? We already saw one, little kid with fatty liver. 
Wash your cough. We decrease our protein intake. Will that lower our albumin level? Yes or no? See, I did it in a logical fashion. I did it in a way where I was just asking myself questions about albumin. Where is it made? Liver. Okay, cirrhosis. Low. Can I excrete it anywhere? Okay, I can't sweat it out now, but I can have a third degree burn. It can lose plasma. Yeah. Can I poo it out? Sure, it's going to absorption, lose protein. Okay, how about intake problems? Yeah, it costs your core. And how about can I pee it out? Sure, it's called lymphatic syndrome. I mean, I mean, there's no memorization involved at all. All it is is thinking. Okay? Having it down, you've got to know the normal first before you can know the abnormal. You don't know the normal, how can you know the abnormal? You can't. All you can do is memorize it. That doesn't mean a hill of beans when a patient comes in because they don't have a question stamped on their forehead. I have A, B, C, D, E. Okay? The stem of the question, of course, is the chief complaint. The A, B, C, D, E is your history, physical, and laboratory tests. It makes it a lot tougher than a USMLE Step 1 exam. And memorization will not help you one iota. You have to be thinking doctors. Okay, so here we go. Are we ready to think? Say yes. But I'm so tired from eating. Well, that's your problem. <laughs> you do know why you're tired? Because you're in alkaline tide. Because for every hydrogen that went into your stomach to make hydrochloric acid while you were thinking about food at around 11 o'clock, that was the cephalic phase of digestion as vagus nerve, as you know, which stimulates directly parietal cells and gastrin-secreting cells, G cells. Every hydrogen that went into your stomach combined with chloride as a bi it was a bicarb in your blood. And so you had developed a little bit of metabolic alkalosis. Okay. Just from thinking about food. And then you had your, in, you had your gastric phase of digestion. Okay. And now you're in your process of reabsorbing the food that you ate. And those hydrogen ions uh, in the food will be reabsorbed and reunite with their bicarb, and you'll no longer be in metabolic alkalosis. But right now, a good many of you are still in it. I can just see you yawning and this and that. Because what's the compensation for metabolic alkalosis, please? Respiratory acidosis. And what happens in respiratory acidosis to your PO2? It goes down. And so you have two reasons for tissue hypoxia right now, and it's all physiologic. Uno, where's your curve, your oxygen dissociation curve? It's left shifted. Okay? And what's your compensation for your metabolic alkalosis, respiratory acidosis, or what's your PO2? Decreased. So when you have tissue hypoxia, do you get tired? Of course. So why did God do that to me? so that you would sit still so that the nutrients that you just ate can be used to store in different tissues of your body for a rainy day to help insulin do its job. That's why. If you're up there, after you ate, and all that ATP and all that stuff, you'd be using up the fuels that you should be storing. That's why God did that, not straight from Him. All right. So here we go. Get your hats on. You're already set. Big P right over there. You're all, you're all set. Okay, so you get the first one. No, I'm only kidding. Don't worry. <laughs> Little click like this. You know what that was? Sphincter. <laughs> all right. It's audible. It's always audible. When it's, when it's quick, fast, you can hear it. Well-trained, you can hear it. Okay, so here's a person that had a myocardial infarction 24 hours ago. He died... And, and this is his lung, and we have this fluid coming out. Okay? Transidate or exudate? Transidate. Okay? Uh, mechanism. Uh, decrease onchotic pressure, increase hydrostatic pressure. Which one? Increase hydrostatic pressure. Left heart failure or right heart failure? Left heart failure due to a myocardial infarction. So things backed up into the, uh, what's behind the left heart? The lungs. So, because the cardiac output decreased, the end diastolic volume and pressure in the left ventricle increases. And that pressure is transmitted back into the left atrium, what empties into the left atrium, the pulmonary vein. Normally, it has an 8 millimeter hydrostatic pressure, and the oncotic pressure is 25. So, the oncotic pressure is winning by 25 minus 817. 
And as a hydrostatic pressure keeps on going up, as it backs up into the lung, all that blood, okay, then it eventually approaches the oncotic pressure, then you start leaking a transudate into the interstitial space, which activates your J receptors, and you're starting to get dyspnea, Corley's lines on an x-ray, from that fluid in the interstitium. Then eventually goes full-blown into your uh, alveoli, pulmonary edema, which is what this is. Okay. This patient was envenomated by a bee sting on the arm. And this happened to the face. Okay, exudate, transudate, lymphedema. What is it? It's an exudate because this is what reaction. If the face swelled up with a bee sting over here, this is a anaphylactic reaction. So who's the main operator in this? Histamine. What type of hypersensitivity? One, increased vessel permeability. There's an exudate here. That's what's causing a tissue swelling. Very good. First step in management. Airway. Next step. Board question. Okay, one to one thousand uh, aqueous uh, epinephrine subcutaneously. Okay, they expect any second year medical student to know that. So that was a board question. Okay. Oh, this is going to be a fun one. This patient has cirrhosis of the liver. Okay, there's pitting edema in those legs. There's ascites there. Let's start here. Mechanism, transudate or exudate? Transudate, mechanisms. Two answers. Decrease oncotic pressure. Why? Can't synthesize albumin. What's the other one? Increase hydrostatic pressure. Why? Portal hypertension. Very good. Because you have cirrhosis of the liver and the portal vein empties into the liver, it can't. So the hydrostatic pressure increases in it and it pushes the fluid out into the uh, peritoneal cavity. So there's two mechanisms for the ascites. There's also one other one that's an aldosterone, increase in aldosterone, reabsorbing salt and water. Okay, but here's pitting edema in the legs. I want the mechanism for that, please. Come on. Come on. Is it an increase in hydrostatic pressure? No. Is it a decrease in oncotic pressure? Yes. Okay, I'm changing the scenario. The patient that had left heart failure really didn't die. But then... Um, he started developing dependent pitting edema that looked like that. What would that mechanism be? An increase in hydrostatic pressure. When you're in right heart failure, then blood behind the failed right heart is your venous system. So isn't it interesting? These legs, depending on what the scenario was, has a different mechanism. If it's cirrhosis of the liver, then it's a decrease in oncotic pressure that did it. If it was the person with right heart failure, then it would be an increase in hydrostatic pressure that did it. Are you with me? This is boards. This is USMLE step one. That's the way they ask these things. You guys seem to be handling it okay. You should start feeling good. I don't want to feel bad. Well, that's nice. You want to do that? That's just fine. You just feel bad. All right. This patient had a modified radical mastectomy on that breast and then developed this non-pitting type of edema diagnosis, lymphedema. This is the most common cause of lymphedema in this country. A lot of times in third world countries, it's uh, Wucheria bancrofti and different parasitic worms that screw up your lymphatics. Don't forget lymphogranuloma venereum, guys, uh, and gals. That also produces lymphedema. Remember, that's a subtype of chlamydia trachomatis. And it has this tendency of scarring tissue and lymphatics. And you can get lymphedema of the scrotum. You can get lymphedema of the vulva associated with that. You're aware of uh, inflammatory carcinoma of the breast the peau orange appearance of the breast. That's uh, also an example of lymphedema too because if you do a section through the breast and this terrible uh, form of breast cancer, you'll see the dermal lymphatics plug with tumor. And so what happens is the lymphatic fluid leaks out into the interstitium and then the uh, ligaments that hold the skin down, uh, uh, you know, tether the skin down, they get this excess fluid in there, you get this dimpling effect that looks like the surface of an orange. That's lymphedema too. But the number one cause of lymphedema in this country is post-radical mastectomy. And believe it or not, uh, uh, you can run the risk of lymphangiosarcoma when you have chronic lymphedema of any extremity. So you can end up with a sarcoma from this, too. This is a horrible thing. She has to hold her, hand, uh, her arm up on that hand because that probably weighs about 50 pounds. All that excess fluid in there. Not good. Not a good situation. Very hard to treat. Good. You did good. Now we'll see if you, what you learned about renal fizz. Okay. All right. Well, ECF, ICF. 
kind of a great name for a kid, you know. Sure. We can call them nephritic, nephrotic, you know, that's not, hey, nephritic, get over here. Nephrotic, you go. Okay? Now, ECF, over here. ICF, go. All right. ECF is extracellular fluid, two compartments, vascular, interstitial. Interstitial is two-thirds larger than the vascular. ICF stands for intracellular fluid compartment. It's two-thirds larger than the ECF. Okay, so want an integration on that? I'll give you one. You get three, la oh, okay. How many liters of isotonic saline would you have to infuse in a patient uh, to get one liter into the plasma? The answer is three, because it's a two-third, one-third relationship. You have to get three liters of isotonic saline, because two of those liters would end up in your interstitial space, and only one of them would end up in your vascular compartment. See, that's why in order to keep the patient's blood pressure up when you're hypovolemic or for whatever reason, you need to really infuse the isotonic saline because it's not just staying in your vascular compartment. It's equilibrating with the interstitial fluid compartment. They actually asked that question on boards. Good question. Quite a lot of you. Okay. So, that's an important concept uh, that I want you to remember. Now, these diagrams over here are very commonly uh, asked on boards, okay, in relationship to different fluid abnormalities, which we'll not go over, but I do have a question on it in my fluid and hemodynamics questions that you can fiddle with. Hopefully, it was discussed with you, but the height of the squares is the osmolality of the plasma, okay, so this is, so the height of this is a, is a normal osmolality of plasma, and the width of these things is the volume in, in each of these chambers. So in other words, if I had uh, a low plasma osmolality, then uh, this, the height of this thing would be lower than, than this over here, be over here. If I had an increase in the ECF compartment volume, then it would be expanded out that way. If I had an increase in ICF volume, it would be expanded out that way. So the x-axis is basically volume. The y-axis is plasma osmolality for these things. We'll see what that means in a second. Osmolality. Okay, what is it? It's a measure of solutes in a fluid. That's what the osmolality is. And they measure it by uh, different kinds of ways that you don't need to know. We talk about serum or plasma. The osmolality is actually mainly due to these three things that you see up here. Glu sodium, glucose, and blood urea nitrogen, otherwise known as BUN. All right. Now, they usually multiply sodium times two. Why would they do that since it's only got one plus there? The answer is that's right because it has chloride with it, and so it's one for the sodium, one for the chloride, and that's why they put two. And we'll take off from there uh, when you come back. That's if you come back. Okay. So I left off with the concept of osmolality. Forget, you know, difference between osmolality, osmolarity. That's, you know, that's garbage stuff. So it's a measure of solutes in a fluid. So you can do a urine osmolality and be the solutes that are in urine. You can do plasma, solutes, and plasma. Spinal fluid, whatever. Sweat, you can do it for that too. So it's two times the sodium. So let's say the normal sodium is 140, so we're up to 280. Ooh, that's high. Okay. Now your glucose is another one that's uh, big, and we divide that by 18. So let's say normal glucose 100, 18 to 100, roughly 5. And that's not contributing a whole lot. Blood, urea, nitrogen. Who could tell me where the urea cycle is located? Liver. And part of it's in the cytosol. Part of it's in the mitochondria. And what is it? Where did urea come from? Ammonia. Okay, that's how we get rid of ammonia. And the end product of, of the urea cycle is urea, but it's ammonia that's fed into, the, fed into the system. So that's how we get rid of ammonia, which is, of course, very toxic. Okay, let's say the normal is about 12, 3 to 12, 4. So what is responsible for, in a normal person, our plasma osmolality? Sodium. Basically, the rule of thumb is you double the serum sodium and add 10. That would be roughly what the measured osmolality would be. All right, that's concept one. All right, now, two of these three things are limited to the ECF compartment. One of them, if it's increased, can equilibrate between the ECF and ICF across the cell membranes. Which one is that? Urea. 
So if your E is increased, that can equilibrate between the ECF and ICF, so there will be an equal amount on both sides. Now I'm going somewhere with this, and it's the concept of osmosis. Okay? Because of the fact that sodium and glucose are limited to the ECF compartment, then changes in its concentration can result in the movement of water from where? From low to high or high to low? What is it? Low to high. Water will move from, from the lower side to the higher side. Just the opposite of diffusion. You better hope that we have diffusion going on in our lungs because you have 100 millimeters of mercury in the alveolar uh, of oxygen, okay? And returning from your, uh, from your um, tissue, you got 40 PO2. So who's bigger, 100 or 40? 100, and so by the law of diffusion, oxygen moves through the interface and dissolves in your plasma to get it up to about 95, okay? That's diffusion. It goes from high to low, but osmosis goes from low to high. Big time mistake oftentimes made by students. Okay, so let's see if you understand that. You have hyponatremia. Which way is water going to go? Is it going to go from the ICF into the ECF or ECF into the ICF? ECF into the ICF because the lower part is in the ECF, hyponatremia. And so water goes into the ICF compartment so it gets expanded by the law of osmosis. Now let's make believe the brain is a single cell just for fun. So what would we see in the brain? Cerebral edema. Would we have mental status abnormalities? Sure. So signs and symptoms of hyponatremia would be mental status abnormalities by the law of osmosis. The intracellular fluid compartment of all the cells in the brain would be expanded. Okay, would be expanded. All right. How about if you had hypernatremia? Okay, which way is there a gradient now between the ECF and ICF when you have hypernatremia? Sure, which way is water going to move? Out of the ICF into the ECF. Okay, so what happens to the ICF compartment? It gets contracted. Okay, so make believe the brain, what's going to happen to all those cells in the intracellular compartment of the cells in the brain? Contracted. What kinds of symptoms will you get there? Small, small thoughts versus large thoughts. No, you're going to get mental status abnormalities, okay? You're going to get mental status. So either way, whether you have high pole or hypernatremia, you're going to get mental status. One from the brain being too, having too much water intracellularly, and the other uh, too little, okay? Now, we don't have time to discuss this, nor is it on boards. Uh, the brain is very unique in that it can make idiogenic osmols. It can actually, within a space of 48 to 72 hours, rehydrate itself uh, anyway, so it's a very, very short-lived thing, but that's something that's not on boys not to worry about. All right, here we go. Let's say you have diabetic ketoacidosis and you've got 1,000 milligrams per cent blood sugar. Okay? So who's winning now is the king of osmosis, sodium or glucose? Uh, because both glucose and sodium are limited to the ECF compartment. Now, some of you are still thinking, maybe. Maybe not. He's saying, Dr. Goya never heard of glycolysis. Glycolysis occurs in the cytosol. So glucose is in the intracellular fluid compartment. No, it ain't. What does glucose always go in with? Phosphorus. Because you know all sugars are phosphorylated to trap them in there. So glucose immediately becomes glucose 6-phosphate and is immediately metabolized. Same thing with fructose. But that's fructose 1-phosphate. Same thing is true with galactose. But that's galactose 1-phosphate. It's metabolized immediately. So there is no glucose in fructose and galactose per se intracellularly. Okay, so which way is water going to move? Come on, come on. Hyperglycemia, 1,000 milligrams. Come on. From ICF to ECF. Okay, so I'm going to... This is my ECF compartment. Normally it has 140 milliequivalents of sodium in here. I'm adding pure water into this cup. And that water is coming from the ICF compartment. What happens to my serum sodium concentration? It goes down. That's called dilutional hyponatremia. And that's as far as you need to go for part one. Okay? To know what happens to the serum sodium when you have hyperglycemia. Okay? Part two I would have taught you a little further. But we don't have to. By the way, these notes are very good for part two. Very good for part two. So you're getting two for one, actually. Okay. They're very good for part two, especially the system stuff. Okay. 
So, that's cool. So the two things that control water movements in the ECF compartment are sodium and glucose. But in a normal situation, who's the one? Sodium, very good. Very good. Urea doesn't control uh, water movements because it's permeable. It can go through both compartments and establish uh, an equal concentration on both sides. So let's get into the concept now. I think the next slide is tonicity. Tonicity. We have isotonic state, we have a hypotonic state, and we have a hypertonic state. Okay, what does this all mean? Okay, well, we have isotonic saline, don't we? We have hypotonic salines, like half normal saline, quarter normal saline. We have plain old 5% dextrose in water. We even have hypertonic saline. We have 3%. We have 5%. Anybody know what percent normal saline is? 0.9%. Okay. So we're referring to tonicity in terms of what the normal tonicity of our plasma is. Of the plasma is. Which is basically controlled by your serum sodium, as you know. Okay. So, um, these are the three types of tonicity. Isotonic, hypotonic, and hypertonic condition. Now, I'll just at this point mention the fact that when we do the serum sodium concentration in a laboratory, actually, it is a reflection of your total body sodium divided by your total body water. Now, most of you have never heard of this thing, but it is a valid concept. Okay? And this is very important for you to understand. Why? Because um, most of you, if I said if you had hypernatremia, would say that means your total body sodium must be increased because if you have an increase in serum sodium, that means your overall total body sodium is increased. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. I can make a hypernatremia and have a normal total body sodium by losing total body water. If I decrease that, what would that do to the serum, serum sodium concentration? It increase it. See, most of you would have thought that. But it's a really a, a, a ratio of total body sodium to total body water. Now, I will show you how you determine total body sodium. It's not measured by any standard way of measuring. It's clinical exam that determines your total body sodium. Serum sodium, they just measure in, uh, in, in plasma and serum. Okay, so that's easy uh, to determine. So we'll go back to that concept. But here's the concept we want to get now. Uh, where are different kinds of uh, fluid uh, abnormalities where we can lose a certain tonicity of fluid or we can gain a certain tonicity of fluid. And they just go berserk on this on boards. And so you need to know what they mean by these things. So when they talk about you have an isotonic loss of fluid, okay, what would they really mean by that? Well, we look at this, this, uh, this, this ratio up here to total body sodium and total body water, what it basically means is you're losing equal amounts of salt and water. Isn't that what an isotonic loss of fluid would be? Yes or no? Okay. And where would this fluid be? This isotonic fluid. Would it be in your ECF and ICF compartment? Or are we talking about mainly you'd be losing it from the ECF compartment? ECF. Very good. Okay. But what would your serum sodium concentration be if you lost isotonic fluid? Normal. Okay. Very good. And what would your ECF compartment look like if you lost isotonic fluid from there? Contracted. But would you have an osmotic gradient for water movement into the ICF or out of it? No. Anybody want to know or anybody know a clinical condition where you can get an isotonic loss of fluid? Oh, that's good. Very good. Hemorrhage would be good. What else? Diarrhea. Adult diarrhea. It's usually isotonic. Usually isotonic. Okay, good. Now, if we have an isotonic gain, that means we have we gain an equal amount of salt and water. Could anyone think of a of a cause of that? Someone getting too much isotonic or normal saline. Okay, instead of uh, three liters, which is what you thought you put down there, you wrote eight. Okay, and they gave eight liters of isotonic saline. Hey, what would you see in sodium be? Totally normal because there's equal amount of salt and water there. But what would be, where would all that excess isotonic saline be? What compartment? ECF compartment. Would there be any osmotic gradient for water movement? No. How about some hypotonic solutions? Well, by definition, that means hyponatremia. I mean, hypoglycemia 
is not going to produce a hypotonic condition because, remember, it was glucose divided by 18. I mean, you can have a 40 blood glucose. 18 in the 40 is going to, like, I mean, I mean, that would be like if you're uh, peeing into the Atlantic Ocean. Is it going to turn yellow when you pee into it? No. Okay? <laughs> it's not going to do anything. Unless they added a dye to it, okay, and if you did pee into the water, it would change color. Okay, so that's nothing. So, in other words, the most common cause of a low osmolality in plasma is hyponatremia. Okay, so how can we get a decrease in serum sodium or a hypotonic condition? Well, what if we lost more salt than water? Okay, if we lost more salt than water, what would the serum sodium be? Come on, they decreased. Okay, so how would you define that type of solution where you're losing more salt than water? Would that be a, a hypotonic loss of fluid, an isotonic loss of fluid, or a hypertonic loss of fluid? Ooh. And where's the main place we deal with sodium, please? To get rid of it or gain it back? The kidney. So this would have to be something involving the kidney. How about a diuretic? Do you think when you give a patient a diuretic, like a thiazide or a loop diuretic, what do you think the tonicity of that fluid is that you lose in the urine? Hypertonic. And so that's why you end up with hyponatremia and a hypotonic condition. What's your ICF compartment look like now? If you have hyponatremia, which way does water move? Come on, come on. Into the ICF compartment. There you go. Very good. Okay. How about this situation? You just gain pure water, but no salt at all. Okay, what would that do? Well, that really lower your serum sodium. You're just gaining pure water. Okay. What do you think would be the most common cause of that? Gaining pure water and no salt. How about inappropriate ADH syndrome? Anybody know some kind of cancer that secretes ADH? It's called small cell carcinoma in the lung. They don't use the term oat cell anymore. That's an older term now. They use the term small cell carcinoma. They don't use oat because it sounds like food. Okay? And so they don't use, you know, uh, foods describing things anymore. Okay? Would you gain pure water? Sure, because you learned in renal physiology that ADH renders the distal collecting and collecting tubule permeable to water. What water? Free water. And so if it's ADH is present 24 hours a day, seven days a week, you're going to be reabsorbing all that water back into your ECF compartment, diluting down your serum sodium, okay? And what would you be doing to the ECF compartment by gaining all this water? Expand it. And then what else are you going to be doing to your ICF compartment? Expanding it. So you're, you're, both ways you're out, you're expanded. Whoop, that way. Okay. Talk about mental status abnormalities. You know what that means? If I had a small cell carcinoma, what have I been drinking? Water. I would lose none of this water in my urine. Why? It would all be sucked out before it even got to the toilet bowl by the ADH. So the more water I drank, the lower my serum sodium. So what would be the treatment of choice for inappropriate ADH? Restrict water. Why don't we restrict salt? Why would you want to do that? Your total body sodium is normal. The problem is you're waterlogged. ADH is there, and you're constantly reabsorbing water. Can you put that into a term, a normal physiologic term? <clears throat> is that dilution or concentration? <clears throat> when ADH is present, come on. When ADH is present, are you going to be diluting a urine, or are you going to be concentrating a urine? There you go. You're going to concentrate your urine because you're taking free water out of the urine and concentrating it. So when you have inappropriate ADH syndrome, you are always concentrating your urine. When an ADH is absent, then what happens? I lose that free water and I dilute my urine. So I've been going into the bathroom, and for all this free water that I've been drinking, I've been peeing it back out because my ADH is suppressed, thank God. But if I had inappropriate ADH syndrome, all this water would stay in my ECF compartment and by osmosis also move into my ICF compartment. The lowest serum sodiums you will ever see are in inappropriate ADH. In fact, I'm going to give you a pearl. Any, on a board exam, part one, two, or three... Serum sodium less than 120, it's always inappropriate ADH is the answer. Always. Lowest 
Has anyone seen a serum sodium in a live patient less than 100 in this room? I saw one that was 86 at Reading Hospital, Reading, Pennsylvania, not too far from here. 86, alive. So I knew immediately when I was called down as an intern, it was inappropriate ADH. It was just a question of what caused it. And she wasn't a smoker, so she didn't have a small cell carcinoma, so I had to think about medications that can increase ADH. And I found out she was a type 2 diabetic. Okay, yeah, that's right. She was on diabetes or chlorpropramide. And hopefully you learn from your pharmacology lectures that all oral sulfonylureas, particularly the first generation ones, 30% of the time produce inappropriate ADH. That's what she was on. Okay, so you got to expand your knowledge on inappropriate ADH syndrome beyond small cell cancers and also include drugs and, and uh, oral sulfonylureas a big time. We'll talk again about that when we do endocrine. Uh, the inappropriate ADH. We're just right now at this point just getting you a concept of tonicity. So here we would have a hypotonic gain of fluid if we were gaining pure water, agreed? Here we'd have a hypertonic loss of salt producing hyponatremia. Okay, here's a situation where you're gaining both water and salt. Ooh, but a little bit more water than salt. And you're still ending up with a hyponatremia. These are your edema states. Your edema states, your pitting edema states, uh, right heart failure, cirrhosis of the liver, uh, those kinds of things have this scenario where you, your kidneys are reabsorbing a little bit more water than salt. You end up with a hyponatremia and you'll end up with pitting edema. I'm just, I'll just spill the beans on this right now. Your total body sodium, when it's increased, always produces pitting edema. I'm going to ask you a question. What compartment is the to all the total body sodium in? Come on. BCF. Okay, which one is the biggest compartment? So where is most of your total body sodium? If it was increased, where would most of it be? In your interstitial fluid compartment. And what does sodium always have along with it? Oh, that's my case. Whenever you have an increase in total body sodium, most of it is in the interstitial space. That automatically will expand it with a transidate, and you will end up having pitting edema. Period. Okay, so this particular scenario is involved in, uh, in heart failure, uh, right heart failure, cirrhosis of the liver, this situation. See how just changing the ratios of these things by, you know, a hypertonic loss of salt, uh, like in diuretics, it can get hyponatremia. Uh, gain of pure water, inappropriate ADH, you get hyponatremia, a hypotonic condition. By gaining a little bit more water than salt, we can end up with hyponatremia, a hypotonic condition. All right, hypertonic state, by definition, means you have hypernatremia or, or, what else? Hyperglycemia. So any patient that has diabetic ketoacidosis is, by definition, in a hypertonic condition. And that's certainly more common than hypernatremia. That's very uncommon to see that. Okay, when you have hypernatremia, I want you to tell me, no matter what the cause of it is, what's your ICF compartment look like? Come on, think osmosis, come on. It's shrunken. There you go, very good. So it's always shrunk. So you're thinking small ideas when you have a hypertonic condition. And you can, we can basically just very quickly do these things. You can gain a little bit more uh, salt and water. Uh, that produce, that's uh, commonly seen in primary aldosteronism. Okay, you can see that situation. Here we can just lose pure water. Well, when we gain pure water, what did we call that disease? Inappropriate ADH. But when we lose pure water, what do we call that disease? Diabetes insipidus. Very good. Whoa! This is so cool. Good. All right. And you can lose a little bit more water than salt in the urine. Okay? Mixture. Okay? That's called osmotic diuresis. When you have glucose in your urine or mannitol in your urine, you lose a hypotonic salt solution in the urine. Now, guess what baby diarrhea is? It's so a hypotonic salt solution. Adult diarrhea is isotonic. Baby diarrhea is hypotonic. So what should, if a baby had no access to water, what should a baby's serum sodium be if they had a rotavirus infection? Come on, come on. It should be high. If you're losing more water than salt, you should have hypernatremia. 
But what do you think most mommies do that don't know dork about how to take care of a baby with diarrhea? Well, they give him water because the baby's going to be thirsty. So you're going to be filling in that denominator because the baby's getting water. And so that baby can come in maybe with a normal serum sodium, or in some cases, if the baby's really sucking on that water, you can even have hyponatremia because you're filling in the denominator. So I'm going to ask you a question. What should you give the baby if they're losing a hypotonic salt solution? It's called Pedialyte, guys. It's called Pedialyte. What do you think Pedialyte is? What do you think Gatorade is? They are hypotonic salt solutions. And they're basically replacing what you lost. If you're losing a hypotonic salt solution, that's what you give them back. A hypotonic salt solution. Now here's another board question. You had physiology, is that correct? Well, some of you are a little worried about shaking your heads. Yes. Why? Because I'm going to ask you a question. What has to be in Pedialyte, what has to be in Gatorade for you to reabsorb that sodium in your GI tract? Ah, very good. Why? The co-transport. Sodium has to be reabsorbed with glucose or galactose. Fructose, it, it, uh, fructose doesn't facilitate its uh, diffusion. That was a board question. I knew it was coming, and it came up in terms of cholera. They asked about, in the oral replacement of patients with cholera, what has to be in that in order for the sodium to be reabsorbed? And the answer was glucose. No glucose, no reabsorption of sodium because of the cold transport pump that you learned about in the small intestine. Now, I did check Gatorade. Gatorade has fructose. That's not going to help sodium reabsorption. But it has uh, glucose. And it has sucrose in it, which is converted into two glucoses. No, glucose and a fructose. So you, that, that is worth getting. Some of these replenishment things don't have glucose in them. They're absolutely worthless. So you're drinking all this stuff, you're not getting any of the benefit from the salt in them. What do you think sweat is? What do you think the tonicity of sweat is? It's a hypotonic salt solution. So wouldn't that look like this? Sure. So what should you have if you were sweating, let's say, in a hot day in a marathon run or something like that? What should you have when you cross the finishing line? Hypernatremia. Now, you should know from all of these different scenarios, which are all in your notes, and I'm not going to be going through these things because I think it's more important for to do answer base with you, which is poorly taught usually by PhDs. So I'm going to do that, and you can go and, and then learn the volume things. No, I can understand that. PhDs don't know uh, clinical things. And answer base is clinical. They usually have it all screwed up. Okay, that's been my experience. I don't know who taught you this. Maybe hopefully they, they did know what they were talking about, but we'll do that. Okay, so these are the uh, tonicity things. All right. Arterial blood volume. Now, I know that probably who would have done this? Passo will do this if he already hasn't started on it. Um, Effective arterial blood volume is the same thing as stroke volume and cardiac output. So I just call it EAB, the effective arterial blood volume. You must absolutely know, guys, when your cardiac output decreases, all the physiologic mechanisms that happen in your body to restore volume, because it's the most serious condition our body can, can happen. When we get hypovolemic, when we have a decrease in cardiac output, that means that oxygenated blood is not going to get to our tissue. We are going to die. And so volume is supreme in our bodies. Okay, volume is supreme in our bodies. It's absolutely essential. So we need to know what our body does before we get to it and screw it up, <laughs> which is usually the case. Okay. Why do you think the death rate in hospitals increases after July 1st? Because of the new uh, residents that come in. <laughs> That's an absolute known fact that the first three, that is the worst time to ever go to the hospital. If you're a patient, never go to the hospital in the first three months after July. July, August, September. Because they all die. Because what does a resident know? That's a person that just came out of medical school. What do they really know about things? Nothing. I didn't know dork. And I was on duty the first day in the Reading Hospital in Pennsylvania. I was on duty for medicine. Bad place to put me. Because, <laughs> yes, what did I pray that I would not have? 
in cardiorespiratory arrest. <laughs> so there was one. Not only one, two. And I was on duty in the 700 bed hospital, me and Adela, the two of us. Same school, Temple Medical School, Philadelphia. That's where I went. Okay, what did I know about cardiorespiratory arrest? Nothing! I don't know how. Thank God for the nurses. What do I do now? You do this, doctor. What do I do now? You do this, doctor. Thank God for the nurses. <laughs> Holy smokes. They both survived. <laughs> they both survived. I didn't know anything. I even called up the villa. Help me, help me. You come with me. I know it's my turn, but come, come. What do we do now? We don't know. What do we know? Give him this doctor. And give him this doctor. Okay. Oh, jeez. After three months, though, after a number of those things, we kindly figured it out, and then people started living. Okay? It was nice, because we're not supposed to do harm to patients, but not those first three months. It's horrible. This is the truth. You don't know anything. And not only that, you're responsible, because you have an MD degree. It's horrible. Well, whatever. <laughs> All right, now, we have baroreceptors. We have low-pressure ones and high-pressure ones. The low-pressure ones are on the venous side. The high-pressure ones are on the arterial side, like carotids and arch of the aorta. Okay, they're usually innervated by the ninth and 10th nerve, the high-pressure ones. Now, when you have a decrease in arterial blood volume, in other words, a decrease in stroke volume or cardiac output, you underfill the arch vessels and the carotid. And so, instead of having a, a vagus and 10th nerve type of a response, uh, ninth and 10th nerve response, you have a sympathetic nervous tissue response. And so, catecholamines are released. And we want catecholamines when our stroke volumes decrease, because what is it going to do to the venous system? Constrict it. You're going to get venal constriction, which is going to increase blood returning to the right side of the heart. That's good. You want that. You certainly don't want venal dilation because that's going to pull it in your in your legs. Okay. What's it going to do to your heart with all those beta adrenergic receptors? Increase the force of contraction. Great. That's going to increase my stroke volume a little bit, not much. Okay. But my systolic will go up a little bit and increase my rate, my chronotropic part, my heart rate will increase. That's both of those are good. Okay, right? What's going to happen to my arterioles on the systemic side? Well, it's going to stimulate the beta receptors and the smooth muscle. Remember, what is your diastolic pressure really due to? It's really due to the amount of blood that's in your arterial system while your heart is filling up in diastole. Who controls the amount of blood that is in the arterial system when your heart is filling up in diastole? Your peripheral resistance arterials are. That's what maintains your diastolic blood pressure. Whoa! So when they're constricted, then there's very little blood going to tissue. So yeah, the bad news is the tissues are not going to get a whole lot of blood. The good news is you're going to keep your diastolic pressure up. Well, why wouldn't that be good? When do your coronary arteries fill, guys? In diastole. So someone's got to get screwed when you're in a bad situation. Okay? So the peripheral resistance arterials constrict. All of that's done by catecholamines without us even being there. And then for free, it stimulates the renin angiotensin aldosterone system sympathetically. So renin's going to be released. Angiotensin is going to be present. What does angiotensin II do? It's a vasoconstrictor of the peripheral resistance arterial, so it's helping along the catecholamines. And then angiotensin II stimulates 18 hydroxylates, which Dr. Porter taught you, converts corticosterone into aldosterone. Okay, and that's what angiotensin II does. And it stimulates aldosterone release. What's aldosterone going to do for us in this situation? We absorb salt and water. That's the most important thing so far, salt and water, to get our cardiac output up. And aldosterone is doing that. So that's all catecholamines. And of course, if, there, if the uh, stroke volumes decrease, then what's the renal blood flow to the kidneys? Decreased? Is that a stimulus also for the renin angiotensin aldosterone system? Sure. And where exactly are those uh, uh, the receptors for that, for the juxtaglomerular apparatus? Exactly where, please? The inferent arterial. It has sensors in it. They're basically modified smooth muscle cells that sense blood flow. 
And so they are we're going to get a little help there. Antidiuretic hormone will be released. And that's not so cool because what's that going to contribute? Just pure water. Is that going to help my cardiac output to increase pure water, or do I want salt to increase my to increase my cardiac output? What do I want? Let me just ask you a question. If I was uh, bleeding to death, here, let's say I cut my wrist here and I was bleeding to death out here, and I lost three liters of fluid out there, well, all of you are saying, "Get a doctor, get a doctor," and a lot of you are doctors. And you will be just milling around me, watching me bleed to death. Okay. Meanwhile, you call nine one one. There's all these doctors in here. Okay pathologist is already going to put a Y-shaped incision on me already here. Okay? He's going to be just checking me out with a Y-shaped incision. Right? The rest of you say, don't touch him, don't touch him, get him, 911. You might have germs. All right. So I'm dying. And finally they come. Okay? How are they going to keep my blood pressure up, guys? They don't have blood there. Normal saline. Normal saline is isotonic. And what compartment is it going to stay in? My ECF compartment. Basically, normal saline is plasma without the protein. That's basically what it is. Isn't it true that any time you have hypovolemic shock from any cause, you can keep a patient's blood pressure up with normal saline uh, just fine? Because normal saline is what stays in your ECF compartment. You couldn't raise my blood pressure with half normal saline. You couldn't keep it up with 5% dextrose and water. It's worthless. To keep my blood pressure up, you have to give me something that resembles plasma and has the same tonicity as plasma. That's what normal saline is. 0.9%. That was actually on part one, that question, too. So ADH will be released also. That's a, it's a, a nerve response. Okay, now, I hope you learn in renal physiology about peritubular capillary pressures. Mm, not really. I'll bet you did. I bet you did. Okay, where did you learn you re that where you reabsorb uh, most sodium in your kidney, in your nephron? There we go. It's the proximal tube. You see, you learned something. 60 to 80 percent of sodium is reabsorbed in the proximal tube. That's correct. Where's the rest of it re reabsorbed? Distal and collecting tube by who? Aldosterone. Okay, so most of it went up the proximal tube. But here's what maybe some of you never think about, like me, until I learned about this. Reabsorb it into what? Peritubular capillaries. That's nice. But, how, what it, but, but in order for them to reabsorb all that uh, salt-containing fluid or anything that it reabsorbs out of the proximal tubule, the Starling's forces in those peritubular capillaries have to be amenable to it. Right? So I'm going to ask you a question. You have two Starling's forces. You have oncotic pressure that likes to keep fluids in the vessel. We have hydrostatic pressure that pushes fluid out of the vessel. Is that correct? Okay. If your renal blood flow is decreased to your kidney when your stroke volume and cardiac output is decreased, what happens to your peritubular capillary hydrostatic pressure? It decreases. So if that's decreasing, what's increasing? your peritubular oncotic pressure, and that is what's responsible for you reabsorbing anything into your bloodstream uh, from the kidney. Woo. So that's why I have PO, oncotic pressure peritubular capillary, is greater than pH, hydrostatic pressure. That's what allows you to reabsorb all that salt-containing fluid from your proximal tubule back into your bloodstream. Okay? So if we add up all the types of fluids that the kidney is going to be reabsorbing in a patient that has a decrease in cardiac output, any cause you want, guys, cardiogenic shock, hypovolemic shock, I don't give a hoot and holler what it's causing. Okay, this happens automatically. Every, every patient. Okay? So, does anyone know what the tonicity of the fluid is that you reabsorb out of the proximal tubule? That's all. It's roughly isotonic. Mm-hmm. So that's good. That's just like giving a normal saline. So let's put two or three liters of that in here. Okay, just this cup. That the proximal tube is reabsorbing because the peritubular oncotic is greater than hydrostatic pressure. But what is ADA? What is aldosterone reabsorbing? What is aldosterone? From the renin angiotensin, what is that reabsorbing? Roughly isotonic salt solution, but not near as much as the proximal tubule. So let's put a liter of that in there. Those are all very nice things to have in our bloodstream. But what's ADH contributing? Pure water. Ooh. So let's put two liters of pure water 
into this cup, the ECF compartment. So when you add that all up now, you have all this isotonic saline reabsorbed, but now you're adding pure water, what does the tonicity have to It becomes a little bit hypotonic. So that's what the kidney normally reabsorbs back into our ECF compartment when we have a decrease in cardiac output. Okay? This is all must-know stuff, this stuff here, because this is normal physiologic response to a decrease in cardiac output for many causes. Now, what if you had just the opposite? Your stroke volume was increased. Your arterial blood volume was increased. Okay? What would happen there? Well, just the absolute reverse. The baroreceptors are now going to be stretched. They're innervated by the ninth and 10th nerve. And so we're not going to get a sympathetic nervous system response. We're going to get a parasympathetic response. We're not going to have venal constriction and an increase in force of contraction of the heart or anything like that. The object is we're fluid overloaded. Get rid of it. The renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system is not going to be activated with increased renal blood flow. So that's not going to be there. Your ADH is not going to be invited because, because you have volume overload. It actually decreases its release. Your peritubular hydrostatic pressure in those capillaries is higher than oncotic pressure. So even if you reabsorb the salt, you are not able to reabsorb it back into your bloodstream because it wouldn't get in there. You pee it out. And so you will lose a hypotonic fluid in your urine when you have an increase in arterial blood volume. These are all normal things that you must know. What happens when you have a decrease in cardiac output, all the physiologic responses, what happens when you have an increase. There's also a certain hormone made in your left and right atrium that will be released if you have dilatation of right or left atrium. And what is that? Atrial natriuretic peptide. And what is that going to get rid of? No? Well, it'll cut off ADH, but what does it also get rid of? It's natriuretic, guys. Okay? It'll get rid of salt. This guy actually acts as a diuretic. Mm -hmm. uh, Atrial natriuretic uh, peptide is only released in volume overloaded states. Okay? It's not released when you have a hypovolemic condition. No way, Jose. It's only when those atrium, either right or left, are dilated with excess fluid. That's when it's released. So these are normal things that you need to know. Okay, here's a boy question for you. Problem, move, okay. Patient given 3% hypertonic saline. Then they have this little chart down here where they had p on the y-axis and they had serum ADH on the x-axis. And they had these little dumb letters, A, B, C, and D. Okay, now in your book, I put a little square in the middle. That represents normal. <laughs> Okay? All right, so 3% hypertonic saline. What would that do to the osmolality? What are you adding to the patient? A hypertonic salt solution. What has to happen to the osmolality? Increase. So you know the answer is either going to be B or C. You know that automatically. Okay? So if you have an increase in P osm, what would that do to the serum ADH? It increases it. Remember, an increase in osmolality of plasma or serum causes a release of ADH. Okay, so then we'd have to go over, well, ADH goes from low to high, and so C is the answer. And this was a board question. But because I'm so nice to you, I actually put what A and B and D would also be in a normal situation. Why? Because if they use this chart for that question, well, then they'll use this chart for diabetes insipidus. They'll use this chart for inappropriate age. Let's do inappropriate ADH. Okay. What's the plasma osmolality in inappropriate ADH syndrome? Low. So you know that it's either A or D. Okay. And what about ADH levels? High. So is it A or is it D is the answer? D. There you go. How about diabetes insipidus? That's no ADH. Okay? So what does that do to serum sodium? It goes high, so it's either going to be B or C. And what's the ADH levels? Low. So which answer is it? D is correct. Very good. See how easy this is? It is when you do it, but then I get it as a problem and I get all confused. Welcome to the club. Make it sound so simple. 
then I get home and I say, I got this, and I look at it, and what did he say? What did he say? I'm all confused. Okay, and then in your confusion, you try to read something, you get all anxious, all angry, and you get mad at yourself. Does that pretty well describe it? We're all there, all there. We all had that problem. So get over it. It's, it's, it's under, if you understood it now, basically you do understand it. it it's there. Trust me on that. All right, so here's this thing again, and I promised you that I would tell you how you can tell what the total body of sodium is in the patient. Well, you're going to tell me. I'm going to show you two pictures. This person, I want you to look at the tongue. And this person, I want you to look at those indentations in the skin. Okay, what's the total body of sodium in this patient with the dry tongue? Decreased. What's the total body of sodium in that patient? Aye. Physical exam tells you. Mayo Clinic proceedings said it is a very accurate way of telling total body sodium. Physical exam. So what you call dehydration, you know about skin turgor? When you pinch the skin... Okay? And it goes up and see how mine went down real easy? Do you know that when you pinched my skin like that and it went down, that says that my total body sodium is normal. You're basically testing what your total body sodium is in your interstitial space by pinching the skin. That's what skin tartaruga tells you. So that's very important to do, except in old people, they all have it. You know? So they want to use something like the chest or the back or something like that. And then looking in the mouth and looking at the mucous membranes. So all those things you know about for dehydration, if they're present, you can assume that total body sodium is decreased. If none of them are there, you can assume total body sodium is normal. If you have pinning edema, dependent pinning edema in a patient, total body sodium absolutely is increased. Absolutely, unequivocally. Okay? So that's how you can tell... Um, the total body sodium in a patient by physical examination. Very important. So I'm going to ask you just a couple of questions. If I had inappropriate ADH and I'm gaining pure water, what's my total body sodium? Normal. But what's my serum sodium concentration? Low. What would I have to restrict? Water. Okay. I have right heart failure and I have dependent pitting edema like that dude on the right. Okay, what did I say was the, um, the fluid that the kidney reabsorbs when your cardiac output's decreased? Hypotonic salt, so it's a little bit more water than salt. Put that into the serum sodium formula. A little bit more water than salt. Okay, what's your serum sodium going to be? Low. Okay, what's in the numerator? Was the numerator increased with total body sodium? Yes. But in the denominator, they had a greater increase in total body water. Is that correct? I'm going to ask you a simple question, like they did on part one boards. What's your non-pharmacologic treatment of any of the edema states, like heart failure and um, cirrhosis? Restrict salt, restrict water. What's your treatment for inappropriate ADH? Restrict water. What's your treatment for any pitting edema state? Restrict salt, restrict water. Isn't that correct? That's all you need to know for part one. <laughs> In terms of that. You have to restrict salt and water. Now, what would your pharmacologic treatment be if you had a pitting edema state? Diuretics. That's going to help get rid of a little bit more of the salt and also lose some water at the same time. But your non-pharmacologic treatment is restrict salt, restrict water. Why? Because you know you have an increase in total body water, so you've got to restrict water, and you have an increase in total body sodium, so you have to restrict sodium. It's just that simple, guys. It's just that simple. And it's good enough for part one to get a lot of questions right. Okay, that's enough on that. Shock! Some of you are in shock right now, so I don't even have to teach you about it. I mean, that's going to be just something. Well, let me see how I feel right now. I'm cold and clammy, but that's about the best. All right. Can you give me some causes of hypovolemic shock just to make sure we're all talking in the same wavelength here? Uh, how about diarrhea? Would that, could that produce diarrhea? Yeah, cholera produce hypovolemic shock. How about blood loss? Sure, that can do it. How about sweating? Oh, yeah, that can produce hypovolemic shock. How about diabetes insipidus? No. What are you losing? Pure water. What's your total body sodium? Normal. You are not in hypovolemic shock. You couldn't be in hypovolemic shock if your life depended on it. We're losing pure water. You're going to feel sick. <laughs> oh, yeah. 
because you're going to be shifting blood, uh, you know, fluid out of your ICF compartment. You're going to be thirsty as all get out, but you're not going to be hypovolemic because all you're losing is pure water. Where would you be losing most of that pure water from? The ICF compartment. You will you have a perfectly normal exam in a patient with diabetes and said, "Is this going to be thirsty?" You can't. You can't have it. You won't have no signs of dehydration whatsoever by losing just pure water. None. It's the salt that's important. You lose just a little bit of salt, and all of a sudden you are hypovolemic. Here's a test that they actually had on part one. Okay, make sure that you know this one because it was a sample question that the USMLE uh, sent out, and I happened to answer it for Kaplan. Uh, right at the answer, it was some a young lady that had a hypovolemic uh, shock, and they asked how you treated the patient. You know, what would you treat her with? Okay. And here's what they put in the stem of the question, so you know they can ask it on part one because they, it was a sample question they've already given. Out. They said that when she was lying down, her blood pressure uh, was normal and her pulse uh, was normal. When they sat her up, the blood pressure went down and the pulse went up. What does that mean? That means they're volume depleted, guys. That's called the tilt test. You better know the tilt test. Why was the patient's blood pressure and pulse normal lying down? No effect of gravity, guys. Okay, you're lying flat, and so you had a reasonable amount of blood returning to the right side of the heart and then left side of the heart, and was able to maintain your cardiac output. Everything was fine. But when you sit the patient up, you decrease, by, by imposing gravity, you decrease the venous return to the right side of your heart. And so if you're hypovolemic, it'll show up by a decrease in blood pressure and an increase in pulse. All those things we just talked about when your, audio, when your cardiac outputs decrease. And what was it due to? Catecholamine effect. Blood pressure went down, pulse went up. Or another way they could do it is they could say that you have, let's say, 100 over 80 blood pressure and a 110 pulse lying down. You sat them up, they get a 70 over 50 blood pressure, the pulse is 150. Is that a difference? What does it mean? It means you're severely hypovolemic. It's called the tilt test. That was actually in the stem of the question on a part one USMLE sample question. See, they give away ideas when they give out those sample things. Any good educator would know, you know, what they think is important by that, something like that. Okay, what was your first step? In fact, the, treat, the answer was, what they, what they were asking was, how would you treat the patient? And they had half normal sailing down there. They had normal saline down there. They had 5% dextrose and water and some other retarded things. What was the answer? Normal saline was the answer. Okay, so that was the answer to that one. So let's, let's uh, break for 10 minutes. Okay, let's start up again. Let's start up again. Okay, let me just uh, run a couple questions by you. Let me run a couple questions by you to make sure you understand something. I'll give you a personal example. My first marathon in San Diego. I didn't take any, any fluids uh, the first 20 miles. None. Zip. I was feeling good. Felt good. And then I hit what they call the wall. That means zip glycogen in any body, part of your body. And it's like you're walking in slow motion. Okay? And it was a pretty, pretty warm day that day. And so I was losing a lot of sweat. Okay? So what is the tonicity of sweat, please? It's a hypotonic. Is it pure water or does it have salt in it? So it's a hypotonic salt solution. Is that correct? Okay. Now, this didn't actually happen to me from this point on, but let's say it did. The first part was correct. Okay? I did finish the race. I walked, walked in, and what do you think was the impetus for that? Was it the old man that ran by me? No. Was it the teenage that ran by me? No. So what was it that was able to get me the last six miles to the finishing line when I was in a state of complete hypovolemic shock? A woman ran by me. <laughs> That is true. <laughs> you 
You can show she beat me. I just oh, I'm gonna, she do it. I can do it. <laughs> you know, I finished in three hours and 30 minutes, and I walked the rest of the way from 20 miles to the other six miles. So you, might, you can imagine how fast I was running the first 20. What an idiot. Okay, so let's say I collapsed. You do a tilt test on me. I'm, uh, I'm 100 over 80 lying down with a pulse of 120. You sit me up, I get a little woozy. I'm now 70 over 60, 150 pulse. Am I hypovolemic from my sweating? Yes or no? What's your first step in management? What are you going to infuse in me? You're going to stick an IV in me. What are you going to give me to get my blood pressure up? Normal saline. Okay, so you put a liter in. I'm still showing no signs. You put another liter in. My blood pressure is now normal. But I still have signs of volume depletion, dry mouth and stuff like that. I'm still not completely uh, together. Okay? And so what are you going to hang up now on me? Okay, you got my blood pressure stabilized. What did you say the tonicity of my fluid was that I was losing? Hypotonic salt solution. So what are you going to hang up on me as an IV? Hypotonic salt solution. Could you give me an example? Are you going to give me 5% dextrose in water? No. Why? Because there's no salt in it. Are you going to give me half normal saline? Yes, you are. That's correct. So what's the maximum of, of fluid therapy when you lose something? Give the patient what they lost. If I lost a hypotonic salt solution, that's what you give me. But if I'm hypovolemic, what's the first thing you always start with? Normal saline. I'll give you another example. Diabetic ketoacidosis. Do you have osmotic diuresis going on? Yes or no? What did I say was the tonicity of the fluid that, uh, that occurs that you lose in your urine when you have excess glucose in it? You have hypotonic fluid. A little bit more water than salt. Agreed? Okay, so anyone that's taken care of a DKA patient knows when they take a blood pressure on them, they are severely hypovolemic, and that's the thing that kills them. The, blood, the high glucose is nothing. Nothing. Your first step in management is volume repletion. So they all have hypovolemia. Some of them are in hypovolemic shock from all that salt and water loss. So what's your first step in managing a patient with diabetic ketoacidosis? Normal saline. You put insulin in? No, that's worthless. You just give them normal saline. What's the purpose? Make them normal tensive. It may take liters. Usually you're out six to eight liters of fluid when you have diabetic ketoacidosis. You may take six, seven liters of isotonic saline before that blood pressure starts stabilizing. Okay, now I'm feeling better. I've still got my 1,000 milligrams per cent glucose, but, but volume-wise, I'm fine now. Now what are you going to do? What am I losing in my urine, guys? More water than salt. What are you going to hang up now on me and put insulin into it? Normal saline? What am I losing in my urine, guys? Hypotonic salt. What are you going to hang up on me? Half normal saline, and what are you going to put into it? Glucose. I mean uh, insulin. That's right. So the maximum is whenever you have uh, your hypovolemic, what's your first step in the management of the patient? Normal saline to get the blood pressure normal. Then... You can decide what if, if you still need to give IV fluids, then you have to decide, well, what's causing the, what caused the hypovolemia? Was it sweating? Then you give me a hypotonic salt solution. Was it the diarrhea and I'm an adult? Well, then I just stay with the normal saline because that's an isotonic salt that I'm losing. You understand? Let's say you had a patient with diabetes insipidus, okay, and for some reason you didn't know they had it and they went through a, a long surgery and they didn't have, okay, they probably ended up with a 160 serum sodium and all that stuff, okay, and um, they get out of surgery, you notice they got a 165 serum sodium, okay, and, and then you find out eventually that the patient uh, has diabetes insipidus. How would you treat that? Let's say the blood pressure, let's say the patient's uh, blood pressure and everything's stable and the patient is lucid. What would you want to give them? Water. <laughs> but let's say you couldn't, you, uh, it was just too dangerous to do it. They could aspirate it after surgery. What would you give them? What are they losing, guys? Pure water. What are you going to give them? Water. IV. And so what are you going to probably put in the water? You're probably going to make it what? 5% dextrose in water. Okay. There's nobody that's just going to give them pure water because when that patient looks at their bill okay, and sees that they were given pure water IV, you know, 35 bucks. Yeah, they say, hey, I could have drank that, buddy. 
And so he had 5% dextrose and water. Whoa, I got something important. No, all you did was get 50 grams of glucose. Okay? They just give that to give you little carbs. Because so basically, you give the patient, if they have to get an IV and they have diabetes insipidus because they lost pure water, give them something close to pure water. 5% dextrose and water is close enough. You're certainly not going to give them half normal saline because they haven't lost salt. They're going to salt overload them. Okay, that's just, we're getting off the, uh, off the concept for part one. It's more part two-ish, but uh, um, let's just stop there at that point. Okay, shock. Okay, we have uh, four kinds of shock. Part two deals with neurogenic, and so we're not going to deal with that, usually in the context of spinal cord injuries. And that's when you really got to know how to diagnose neurogenic shock. Now, we went through hypovolemic shock, and you brought up a couple things, blood loss. It could be uh, diarrhea, adult or kid. Anytime you lose salt, you can end up in hypovolemic shock. Okay, that's basically it. Now, cardiogenic shock is most commonly due to a myocardial infarction. You all knew that. And then septic shock is most commonly due to E. coli. That's actually the most common cause of sepsis in a hospital. And where do you think it's coming from? An indwelling urinary catheter. It's not staph aureus. Most people would say when you're in a hospital and you get septicemia, that's most commonly staph aureus from an IV. No, E. coli beats it. Hands down. Okay, so the most common cause of septic shock is E. coli. Now, you had microbiology, and what makes a gram-negative a gram-negative organism, please? Endotoxins. Endotoxins in the cell wall is a lipopolysaccharide. So gram negatives have lipid in their cell wall, gram positives don't. What is that lipid in the cell wall of a gram negative? Endotoxins. So a gram negative organism is gram negative because of endotoxins in its cell wall. And so if you have an E. coli sepsis, you got a big time problem because you're going to be in what is called septic shock. Now you can get it from gram positives. Gram positives have toxins in their wall too, but it's way more common with gram negatives, specifically E. coli, big time, big time. All right, let's take the standard hypovolemic and cardiogenic shock, okay? What's my skin going to feel like? Talk to me. Cold and clammy. Why? Basal constriction of my peripheral vessels. By who? Just go through what we just went through. What's my, what's my EABV, stroke volume, cardiac output? Decrease. What did I say was the main? Catecholamines and angiotensin II and all those other things are going to constrict my vessels in my skin and redirect the blood flow to more important organs in my body, like brain and kidney. So I have cold, clammy skin. What's my blood pressure? It's decreased. What's my pulse? It's increased. Very good. That's you see in classic hypovolemic or cardiogenic shock. Not so septic shock. Now it's unfortunate that uh, uh, you haven't had uh, passive for cardiovascular because you would have taught you Pousseau's law, which is a which is a is a concept that that teaches you about your peripheral resistance arterioles which control your diastolic blood pressure. Pousseau's law states that total peripheral resistance, referring to your arterioles, is equal to, and I'm going to make this real simple because this is all you really need to know for boards, viscosity of blood in the numerator divided by the radius of the vessel to the fourth power. That's all you have to know about Pousseau's law. So one simple question on boards was, what is the main factor controlling total peripheral resistance? Now that's a no-brainer. It's the radius to the fourth power, obviously. Okay? That's the main thing, because it's to the fourth stinking power. Viscosity is into the fourth power. What controls the viscosity in your, in your blood, guys? Your hemoglobin. And so if you're anemic, what's the viscosity of your blood? Decreased. If you have polycythemia, what's the viscosity of your blood? There you go. So anemia, it's decreased. Polycythemia, it's increased. Okay, so what happens to per your total peripheral resistance when you're anemic? It decreases. Because it's in the numerator. When you have polycythemia, what happens to your total peripheral resistance? It increases. Pretty simple so far, yes? Okay. Now, when you have septic shock, guys, you release endotoxins. They do horrible things. First of all, they activate the alternative complement system. 
and cause eventually the release of C3A and C5A. Does that mean anything to you? What are they? The anaphylotoxins. What are they going to stimulate directly? The mast cells to release what, please? Histamine. What did the histamine do, please? Vasodilatation of what? Arterioles. You mean those peripheral resistance arterioles? One and the same. So if the blood flow is increased through peripheral resistance arterioles, what's your skin feel like? Warm. Just like it did in acute inflammation. Not cold and clammy because they were constricted vessels. These are dilated. But also endotoxins damage your endothelial cells. Anybody know some kind of chemical in your endothelial cells that is a potent, potent vasodilator? I know two. Nitric oxide is one of them, and another one is prostacyclin, PGI2. So we have about two or three vasodilators out there that are, that are causing our peripheral resistance arterials to become dilated big time. So that's to the fourth power. So what happens to total peripheral resistance if we have basal dilated arterioles in this patient and endotoxic shock? Guys, what happens? Talk to me. It decreases. All right. Now, some of you, you're going to need this image to understand what's going to happen. We know that total peripheral resistance arterioles control your diastolic pre blood pressure because when they're constricted, they can control the amount of blood that remains in your arterial system while your heart is filling up in diastole. Okay, so we know that if they're dilated, what automatically is going to happen to your diastolic blood pressure? It's going to pan out, buddy, big time. Okay. Now, I want us to picture a dam and a big reservoir. Okay, and you know that you can take up the dam gates and you can close the dam uh, the, the gates. Not that they're dam gates, but, but they're gates. Okay. I want you to picture a situation where all the gates to a dam that are holding back water in a reservoir are wide open. Anyone ever seen something like that? Okay. That's what happens to your blood when your peripheral resistance arterials are dilated. It's just the, water, the blood just come gushing through those arterials. And where's it going to go? Well, to your capillary system, feeding all the, supposedly feeding all your tissues with oxygen. But I'm going to ask you a question. Would that be a good day to go fishing? below a dam, okay, to catch fish when that, when that water's coming out that fast? You think it's going to be something like... You, you think the fish are actually hanging around to look for food? No, they're getting bonked all over the place. Many of them are going to die because of the turbulent water. So, this is a terrible situation. There's all that blood going by, but do you think the tissue can get any of it? All that, any oxygen? No, it's going too fast because it isn't a controlled release of blood. It's coming out too fast. Not only that, is it coming back to the heart faster than normal? Is it? Well, sure, if the arterioles are widely dilated, that blood's going right through real fast and coming back to the, to the right side of the heart faster than usual. It's kind of like your kids when you want them outside of the house because you've got something to do, and you say, I want mommy's got something to do. Okay, I want you out there for 30 minutes. Mommy's got something to do. And so you start doing something, and two minutes later, they're bored and they're already in the house. So I just told you to stay outside so I can do something. Okay, well, I wanted to come back earlier. Well, that's what the heart's saying when there's blood. They'll look back and say, didn't I just pump you out? Yes, you did. What are you doing back so fast? The arterials are dilated. <laughs> so, if blood is coming faster back to the heart, what's the cardiac output in septic shock? It's increased. That's heresy. Which is the, what's the cardiac output in hypovolemic and cardiogenic shock? Decreased. What's the skin feel like? Cold and clammy. But what's the skin feel like in endotoxic shock? Warm, because the vessels are dilated. So it's a high output failure that occurs in septic shock. With warm skin, okay, those are major differences that you even have to know for part one. Part two, you even have to know this also. Okay. Now, I think, and I'm usually reasonably accurate on predicting how these people think that make up this test. I think that swan gans catheter measurements are perfectly legitimate for part one. I know they're on part two. 
because they basically, a swan gland stuck into, a catheter stuck into the right side of your heart measures all the parameters that you learned about in physiology. And so we should be able to understand what they would show in these different types of shock. So let's introduce you to some of these terms that are seen in a swan gland catheter. And we'll be able to actually differentiate these forms of shock quite easily. The first thing is cardiac output. Okay, that can be measured by the swan gans catheter in the right side of your heart very easily. How does it matter? Systemic vascular resistance, that's a calculation that it can make based on things going on in the right heart. That's your total peripheral resistance. That's telling what your arterials are doing. Isn't that interesting? Systemic vascular resistance measured by a catheter on the right side of your heart can actually tell you what's going on in your arterials. Cool. It's a calculation. Now, this is a big one. This is going to, I can assure you will be on the test. Mixed venous oxygen content. Well, you already know what oxygen content is. It's 1.34 times the, hemo, uh, the hemoglobin times the oxygen saturation plus the PO2. Well, you can measure that in the right atrium with a swan gans catheter. It is your absolute best test for tissue hypoxia. Lactic acid stinks because there's lots of things that can increase lactic acid and have nothing to do with tissue hypoxia and anaerobic glycolysis. But this one, mixed venous oxygen content, is what's actually returning from your tissue. So I want you to just think about this now, please. What's your cardiac output in hypovolemic and cardiogenic shock, please? It's low. So would you all agree, not only is there not a whole lot of blood, but it's not being pushed ahead with a great amount of force? Yes or no? Okay. So will the tissue have lots of time to extract oxygen from what little blood there is? Yes or no? Yes. So what happens to the mixed venous oxygen content in hypovolemic cardiogenic shock? Decrease. Very, very low. That is correct. That's just because there's too little of it and it's going through so slow because there's no force behind pushing it through. And so you get, it, it extracts a lot more oxygen out of it than normal. But here's the one that's a little trickier. What do you think the mixed venous oxygen content is in septic shock when it's going through your tissues like the speed of light? It's high. In other words, tissues, even though there's lots of blood there, you can't extract the oxygen out of it. It's going through too fast. Okay? So you know that one. Then you have a thing called pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. We won't tell you how it's done. It's irrelevant. But what is it a measure of? It's a measure of the left ventricular and diastolic volume and pressure. That's cool. So here's a catheter in the right side of the heart that can tell you what the pressure is in your stinking left ventricle. That is cool. All of these things are measured in a swan gans catheter. All of these things you should be able to use and solve and, and, show, and, and be able to show, uh, see what the differences are between these types of shock. Now the next one actually has it all there, but it would be a lot more fun to see if you really understood it for you to tell me, okay? Now, let's take hypovolemic shock and cardiogenic shock together. What's the cardiac output in both of them, please? Decrease. No problem, yes? What is it in septic shock? Increase. Okay. Very good. Now, let's deal with uh, systemic vascular resistance or total peripheral resistance, which is a measure of what? What the arterioles are doing. Okay, what is the total peripheral resistance in hypovolemic and cardiogenic shock? It's increased. Equate that with something, basal constriction or basal dilatation. Basal constriction, very good. What is the total peripheral resistance in septic shock? Decreased. So we have two differences already between those two dudes. We have an increase in cardiac output, warm skin, and we have a decrease in total peripheral resistance. The other dudes have decreased cardiac output, decreased, uh, increased peripheral resistance. Agreed? Mixed venous oxygen content. Uh, hypovolemic and cardiogenic shock, please. Low, very low. Septic shock, high. Okay? So, in other words, this is really separating out real easy so far for between septic and hypovolemic and cardiogenic. But, we have everything the same so far between hypovolemic and cardiogenic. How do we separate that one out? Okay? Pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. What did I say that was a measure of? Left ventricular and diastolic pressure. 
What would the left ventricular end diastolic pressure be in hypovolemic shock? Low. What would it be in cardiogenic shock? I rest my case. There you go. You don't need to know what it is in endotoxic shock. Actually, it's decreased. Is that easy or what? It is. And does it encompass all the physiologic parameters that you do need to know for part one anyway? Sure does. So if they don't ask specifically this type of thing, that will ask, they'll just use other terms. Well, cardiac output's cardiac output. Instead of using systemic vascular, it might say total peripheral resistance. Okay? And they can say left ventricular pressures. Okay? Instead of pulmonary capillary. They're still going to ask it. You know that. And because it's all physiologic principles. My second year students have whipped through this like, a, like, like nothing. No problem at all. They know this. No problem. I know I can get away with this in teaching because my kids are not any sharper than you guys. They have no, don't have any problems in solving these things. Okay? Neither do you. All right. Now, I'm going to ask you another question. Of all the organs in our body, which one suffers greatest from uh, a, decrease, a, a decrease in blood pressure? Kidneys. Kidneys do. What part of the kidneys? Medulla. Okay, now some of you wanted to say brain, didn't you? Not a good choice. Why? Circle of Willis. Your cardiac output's decrease, your circle of Willis will, will uh, distribute blood flow to those areas of the brain. Those are the ones with neurons. Uh, and keep it going pretty good. Yeah, it's important, the brain. But it's got a circle of Willis to redistribute blood. No, no problem if you have a cardiogenic shock hypovolemic in the brain. Okay, at least not for a while. But kidneys? Screwed. <laughs> Screwed. Big time. So it's the kidneys. Isn't it true, guys, when someone has hypovolemic, cardiogenic shock, septic shock, that oliguria and an increase in BUN and creatinine causes shivers in your body because you know that the patient's going into what? Acute tubular necrosis. There you go. And then what's, what, are, what are all the nephrologists screaming? Volume, volume, blood flow, renal blood flow, dobutamine, all that kind of stuff. That increases renal blood flow. We've got to prevent the patient from going into acute tubular necrosis. Why? They're going to die. That's why. And it looks something like this. Does this look like a normal kidney? Well, what's that? That's the glomerulus. Do these look normal? Well, there's nuclei that are just barely there, but can you see vague outlines of what used to be renal tubules, especially in these right over here? Yes or no? This one's hanging in there. It's always someone that hangs in there. Okay? What type of necrosis is this? Coagulation necrosis. And what do you think is going to happen to these dead renal tubules? They're going to slough off and produce renal tubular cast, which is the pathognomonic cast in the urine, in acute tubular necrosis, and block urine flow producing oliguria. In addition, other things will happen, causing a decrease in glomerular filtration rate. Voila, you are an ATN. And your chances of survival are zip. So it's the kidneys that are most affected when your cardiac output is decreased. Brain would probably be a close second because those neurons absolutely need oxygen. But thank God for the circle of Willis, it can redistribute blood flow even though it's decreased and get it to those areas and protect them for a while. Heart, you know, uh, also even has a bit of a collateral circulation in it as well. But kidneys, there ain't no collateral circulation. And since the medulla only gets 10% of the cardiac output normally, when the cardiac outputs decrease, it gets even less. Did you know that a person with sickle cell trait trait, not disease, can get kidney disease because of the renal medulla's oxygen tension is low enough to induce sickling. Did you know that? Because if you didn't, then you would have got the question wrong on part one. Uh, young woman, black woman, has a uh, normal physical exam except laboratory studies reveal microscopic hematuria. Rest of everything was normal. B1, creatinine, everything's normal. What's the first step in the work of the patient was the question. Part one, the answer was a sickle cell screen. Because she probably has sickle cell trait. So no, sickle cell trait is not without its problems. Okay? Because the oxygen tension in the renal medulla is low enough to induce sickling in those peritubular capillaries, which produces microinfarctions in the kidney. Yes, it does. That was on part one, guys. It's on part one. 
Not two. I'm just on there two. But it's also on part one. So that's a must-know thing. We review that again when we do kidneys. But I just wanted to mention how bad that medulla is in terms of oxygen flow, even normally. And so that's what we worry about most because we don't want to produce coagulation necrosis, which is called acute tubular necrosis. All right. I'm going, to teach you, I'm going to teach you acid base, which includes blood gases. Okay? Not hard. This is what I find that most people don't know too well, and you get lose some points on it. Okay? And so I want to go through this. Now, Henderson and Hasselbach screwed us up pretty bad with their stupid logs. They probably had a Lincoln log set and screwed everything up. Let me tell you why it's stupid. Okay, it's stupid because if you have an acidosis, you'd say, okay, that's an increase in hydrogen ions, pH increased. If you have an alkalosis, okay, that's a decrease in hydrogen ions, pH should be decreased. But no, no, it's just the reverse. When you have an acidosis, the pH is decreased. When you have an alkalosis, the pH is increased. And you say, that doesn't make sense. The hydrogen ions are increased in acidosis and they're decreased in alcohol. I don't get it. Logs. Logs is the inversion, inverted uh, concept. So you have to think in reverse. That has screwed up American medicine big time. And this and Hasselbach should be thrown out of all books and they should be burned in effigy <laughs> for causing such massive confusion in students related to acid base. And you know what? There's one other person in some other book that actually wrote that down. I'm even afraid to do it because I don't know if those two dudes are still alive and they're suing me. <laughs> but man, they have screwed it up royally. Big time. So we still have to deal with it. This is the way it should have been written in a long logarithmic form and that would make more sense. If we increase PCL2, that would increase pH or the H, and then you know you'd have respiratory acidosis. If we decrease this, that would increase that. That's, that makes sense. This? I don't make any sense. So I just narrowed down to this. pH is equal to bicarb over PCO2, and I forget all these 6.1s and logs because they're absolutely worthless. And so if we increase the numerator bicarb, what should that do to pH? Increase it, and what do we call that? Metabolic alkalosis. We decrease bicarbonate, what does that do to pH? Decrease. What do we call that? Metabolic acidosis. If we increase the PCL2, what would that do to pH? Decrease it. What do we call that? Respiratory acidosis. And if we decrease the PCL2, what does that do to the pH? De uh, increase it. What is that? Respiratory alkalosis. Good. Compensation. Compensation is totally simple. Okay. Compensation is the body's attempt to try to maintain a normal pH, which it never does, but it tries. Here's a logical concept. If you want to make the pH roughly stay the normal, assuming you could, and you had metabolic alkalosis, which is an increase in bicarb, then what would you have to do to the denominator to keep the pH roughly normal? You'd have to increase it. And so when you increase the denominator, PCO2, what is that? Respiratory acidosis. So logically, respiratory acidosis has to be the compensation for metabolic alkalosis. Right? According to the way the formula is, trying to maintain a normal pH? Yes or no? Now, if you didn't understand that, what's the opposite of metabolic? Respiratory, and what's the opposite of alkalosis? Okay, you can do that. Now, that's, for, that's not a good way, because that doesn't really mean you understood it. It's just a nice way of memorizing it. It is logical for respiratory acidosis to be the compensation for metabolic alkalosis because if this is increasing in a numerator and compensation by definition is the, uh, is the attempt of the body to bring the pH back to normal, then the only thing that would bring that pH back to normal by increasing the numerator is increasing the denominator. And so if we have metabolic acidosis and this is decreased, what do we have to do to the PCO2? We have to blow it off. If we blow it off, what's that called? Respiratory alkalosis, that's the compensation. If we have respiratory acidosis as a primary disease, okay, what are we going to have to do for compensation? We have to raise the numerator, which is bicarbonate metabolic alkalosis. Okay? And if we decrease the denominator as a primary disease, hyperventilation. <laughs> I'm blowing off CO2. Hypoventilation. You learned this from PASO. What does ventilation mean? Is that an oxygen term or is that a CO2 term? It's a CO2 term, guys. 
And so if I say I'm hyperventilating, that means I'm blowing off. Hyper means increasing my respiratory rate. That's going to blow off more CO2. I'm going to get respiratory alkalosis. If I'm hypoventilating, that means my respiratory rate's decreased. I'm going to retain CO2. Respiratory acidosis. I just do screw that up. I don't get it. I don't get why that would be. It's straightforward. You breathe fast. What do you breathe? When you breathe out, what are you getting rid of? CO2. So you lose more. It's decreased. Respiratory alkalosis. If I'm just... What am I, what am I not getting rid of? CO2. In fact, I'll give you something funny. I use a steamer to, for my voice. And so it's a little fake device, and you put water in it, and when steam comes up, and I throw in a little bit of uh, Vicks Vapor Rub liquid, and so I get the menthol. And I put my face over this thing, and I breathe it in through my nose, and it helps my vocal cords. That's what opera star singers use. Okay, I do that because I'm using my voice so much. Well, I thought to get more steam, I put a, a piece of cloth around the thing, this, this, little, this little device like this, so I really get all, all that steam. All that steam, and I was having a little problem with my breathing. I said, God, I'm having, I'm having some problem, and I feel like I need oxygen. <laughs> and so I'm trying to move my gut out from the, the, the edge of the table. It's got to be that. And that dawned on me, I was rebreathing my own CO2. <laughs> Idiot! <laughs> so I took the stupid thing away, and it is regular stick in air, and it has little vents. And so I was getting air, and suddenly I felt better. I was rebreathing my own stinking CO2. Now that'd be a great treatment for respiratory alkalosis, paper bag thing. Just rebreathe it. That's the best thing to do. When someone has an anxious, you no, know, hysterical reaction, stick a bag over their stinking head. If you don't like them, plastic. Okay? <laughs> That'll solve the thing. That'll solve it real fast. Because you rebreathe your CO2. All right. So you got the idea what compensation is. Now I'm going to show you, tell you what uncompensated means, partial compensation. But I will tell you this: full compensation doesn't exist. You never bring your pH back into the normal range, with one exception, and that's chronic respiratory alkalosis in high altitude livers, uh, uh, people that live at high altitude. And there's none that live high enough in this country to have that. That would be like Peru and places like that. That's the only case that's known in all the history of medicine where you can bring the pH right back smack into the normal range. And no one's still been able to figure out how that's possible. So normally you bring it close to the normal range but not into the normal range. So let's do this logically now. Let's talk about the two respiratory conditions, respiratory acidosis and respiratory alkalosis, okay? And let's do it logical. Let's deal with things that deal with CO2. All right? And so you already know this already. You know that the respiratory center is where? The medulla oblongata. That's what controls our breathing rate. Yes or no? And then we have the upper airways. If we obstruct them, then we're going to have a problem with getting rid of CO2. So we have to deal with that. Then we have to deal with the chest bellows. What did Tassel call the chest bellows? What's the most important muscle of respiration? Your stinking diaphragms. Because when the diaphragms go down, what happens to your negative intrathoracic pressures? They increase. And what does that suck into your lungs? Air. What does it suck into the right side of your heart? Blood. That's why your neck veins collapse on inspiration. The negative vacuum sucks blood and air into your chest, guys. And on expiration, you have a positive intrathoracic pressure. It pushes things out. It helps your left heart push blood out. It also helps get rid of air. You with me? This is just simple respiration stuff. That's your chest bellows, your diaphragms, your intercostals, your sternocleidomastoid, but definitely your diaphragm. And then, of course, you got your lungs. Let's deal with it, okay? Here. All right? If I take a barbiturate with something that depresses my respiratory center, what's going to happen? I'm going to get what? Respiratory what? That's it. Respiratory acidosis. I mean, that's just a no-brainer. Okay, what if I, if I had CNS injury to my medulla? Respiratory acidosis. Okay, so that's easy. No problem. How about respiratory alkalosis? Most common cause is anxiety. Some of you have that. When you take a test, 
And sometimes you feel strange. You start feeling numb and tingling around your mouth. Tips of your fingers start getting numb. You feel kind of twitchy. That's because you're in tetany. Because as you get alkalotic, and I'll teach you why this happens, your ionizing cal ionized calcium level gets lower, and you are getting tetany. And so you really feel weird. You're twitching, okay, and you're feeling paresthesias, numbness, and tingling. You think you're having a stupid stoke. And what it is is that you're breathing too fast. Okay? Some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. And you just watch your thumb go abduct into your, into, your, into your palm. And you say, I didn't want it to do that. Not knowing that that was Trousseau sign. Or carpal pedal spasm. A sign of tetany. And then maybe you decide to tap over your nerve. <laughs> I mean, you start twitching like mad. You got yourself a positive spastic sign. I mean, that's all tetany. That's because you're breathing too fast. So anxiety is a thing that can uh, cause the rest. By breathing fast, by, uh, by being anxious, you usually breathe faster and you end up with that. Okay, pregnancy. All pregnant women have respiratory alkalosis. You want to know why? Estrogen and progesterone overstimulate the respiratory center. All pregnant women have respiratory alkalosis. A little bit. They say, well, I don't hyperventilate. When I was pregnant, I didn't hyperventilate. Doesn't matter. You had spider angiomas, which are arterial venous fistulas related to your high estrogen. They're in your lungs up the wazoo. You had AV fistulas in there. And so you clear more CO2 per breath than a non-pregnant woman. Of course, the AV fistulas go away after you deliver your baby. you got something going on in your lungs you don't believe when you're pregnant. And sometimes you see those little spider angiomas on your skin. You say, oh my God, what's this? I have cirrhosis. No, you don't. You are pregnante. That means pregnant in Greek. All right. <laughs> All right. All right. Endotoxins overstimulate the system. So all patients in endotoxic shock have respiratory alkalosis. And since they're in shock, you tell me what else they have. Are they in anaerobic metabolism? Yes or no? Yes. So what else do they have? Metabolic acidosis. Due to what? Lactic acid. There you go. So they have one teaspoonful of respiratory alkalosis because endotoxins overstimulate it. All right? Let's just do a cooking class. Some of you understand that. Here's one teaspoon of respiratory alkalosis from the endotoxin overstimulating your system and one teaspoon of metabolic acidosis. I'd like you to tell me what the pH is. Normal. That's what you get. Does that, does that mean you're fully compensated? Oh, no. It means you've got two blood gas disorders at once. <laughs> The one they like for you guys for part one, the one for uh, endotoxic shocks part two is salicylate intoxication. Salicylates also overstimulate your respiratory center. So what's that one teaspoon of, please? Respiratory al alkalosis, right? And salicylic acid is what aspirin is, guys. And so it's an acid. You're adding an acid to the body. So what's that one teaspoon of? Metabolic acidosis. So what should your pH be? normal. There you go. Now, you don't have to get into the big deal about kids with salicylate intoxication versus adults. Now, I know that those of you that are pediatricians know that they go through the, uh, uh, the respiratory alkalosis phase very quickly, and they end up making profound metabolic acidosis. I know that. And the boards uh, doesn't, doesn't make that distinction. Usually, you see it in adults. Usually rheumatoids that are basically borderline or actually overtly toxic. They have tinnitus, all the signs of salicylate intoxication. And, you know, they're the ones that usually have that mixed disorder. But they, if you figure out that they have salicylate intoxication, they're looking for a mixed disorder. So look for the normal pH. I'll show it to you. Don't worry. Don't worry. I'll show you what it looks like. All right, so we're done with respiratory center. Now, I don't know of any cause of respiratory alkalosis from an upper airway thing. Okay, how about this? Let's see how good you are. Got a kid, six years old, who has <laughs> inspiratory strider. Okay, first step in management, crash cart. And then you uh, carefully bring the kid down to x-ray. You do a lateral x-ray, and you see the thumbprint sign. You have a swollen epiglottis diagnosis. Acute epiglottitis organism, please. H influenza. Okay, is it still markedly increased in kids? No. The vaccination has decreased it immensely. See, that's why... 
H. influenza meningitis is no longer even close to being the most common meningitis in kids anymore. Most common one uh, depends on age. If you go over from one month to 18 years of age, it's Neisseria meningitis is the most common. H. influenza is way down the list unless the kid did not get vaccinated. So we don't see that anymore. Now let's make it a three-month-old. Now what? Croup, laryngotracheal bronchitis organism, parainfluenza. You do a lateral x-ray, steeple sign. In fact, they asked on part one, where is the obstruction in croup? Answer, trachea. It's not at the level of the larynx, it's below it. It's swollen. That's part one. I thought that was pretty interesting. Then there's a cafe coronary. That's the dude that's at a buffet usually. And usually hunched over their food with their eyes staring at the buffet line while they're shoving food into their mouth, worried that the shrimp are going to be gone. Okay? It's a... What do you do? Call a doctor. <laughs> okay? You're going to get what? Heimlich. Okay? Heimlich. And what are you going to do? <laughs> Force them pointing towards their table, by the way. Okay? Because you don't want that big gob of crap to come out on your table. Okay? You're going to be a hero with everybody else. You're so wonderful. You're so perfect. But every one of your table is going to be looking at you, you jerk. Why did you do it? went right on my damn soup. Okay? Now, what if they can talk? What do you do? Leave them alone. Because they're partially obstructed. Let them cough it out. They can't talk, full obstruction. That's part two. Okay, so that's called cafe coronary. All right. Chest bellows. Well, I can think of all kinds of things that can screw up my diaphragm because it's innervated by the fourth nerve, which is the phrenic nerve. So I can make it a herb Duchenne palsy on a kid that's delivered by a breach and there's a brachial plexus injury, and the kid's having respiratory difficulty, chest x-ray reveals the diaphragm on the right side elevated. Well, if you paralyze the diaphragm, you're going to be able to retain it. Uh, what are you going to do to CO2? Retain it, okay, because of that. I can think of these horrible diseases, like Lou Gehrig's disease, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. That's how you usually die, because your lower motor neurons are gone, and so are your upper motor neurons, and you can't breathe. Because your diaphragms are paralyzed, your intercostals are paralyzed, and you're going to die. I can think of Guillain-Barre, favorite board question. You have an ascending paralysis in someone one week ago that had an upper respiratory infection. Now they're getting a paralysis. Spinal fluid shows increased spinal fluid protein, a slight increase in lymphocytes, gram stain negative. Diagnosis, Guillain-Barre, a demyelinating disease. Okay, that can do it. Polio. Polio virus, as you know, destroys lower motor neuron, upper motor neuron things. That could do it. So things that paralyze the muscles of respiration produce respiratory acidosis. I can't think of anything for respiratory alkalosis that would, do, that would deal with that. And, of course, lungs, obstructive lung disease, restrictive lung disease. You did have respiratory lectures by an expert on that who told, actually runs a lab for pulmonary function tests for crying out loud. That's PASO. And so you learned obstructive lung disease is not a problem with getting air in. It was a problem in getting air out. Compliance increased. Elasticity decreased. You remember that. So you're retaining CO2. So what do you usually have in obstructive lung disease? Respiratory acidosis. As opposed to restrictive lung disease like sarcoid, pneumoconiosis. The, uh, i got to finish off Kaysan's disease, which, believe it or not, they ask a lot of questions on. Just like they do high altitude, they ask about people that like to go underwater, which amazes me why would somebody want to do something like that. For every 30 or 33 feet, depends on who you read, you increase uh, one atmospheric pressure. So in other words, if we're 760 here, it's 760 times 2 when you're down underwater 30 to 33 feet. The reverse is true when you go in high altitude. For example, on the top of Mount Everest, the atmospheric pressure is 200. You're still breathing 21% oxygen, which most people don't understand. You're breathing still just like the oxygen we're breathing here, but the atmospheric pressure is less. And you learned uh, the formula from uh, Dr. Passo about how to calculate alveolar oxygen, right? 
it's uh, 0.21 times what your atmospheric pressure is, right, minus the PCO2 divided by 0.8. And so uh, you can see right off the bat that 0.21 times 200 is only 42. <laughs> okay. And so uh, you subtract from that, let's say, the normal of 40 for PCO2, 0.8 into 46. I mean, you're talking about maybe 2 millimeters of mercury of, um, of uh, air in your alveoli. So you can see why you have to hyperventilate at high altitude because as you lower the PCO2, what do you automatically do to the PO2 in your blood? It goes up. You have to hyperventilate, otherwise you die. But when you go under, the atmospheric pressure increases. So uh, what happens is the nitrogen gases get dissolved in your tissue at the increased pressure. So if you're down there exploring something underwater, maybe 60, 70 feet, and then some denison from the deep is starting to come up and just kind of check you out for lunch, okay, you could potentially want to get up fast, you know, and get out of there. And because of that, what happens, like shaking a soda, a soda bottle, the gas comes out of, uh, out of the, it, uh, it was dissolved in the fat and stuff like that. It comes out as bubbles. And the bubbles get in your tissue and also in your blood vessels, and they block the blood flow. That's called the bends. You get tremendous pain. And you can end up with quadriplegia because the little vessels that supply your spinal cord are very susceptible to that. Uh, bladder, loss of bladder control, and eventually you could die from something like that. So the treatment for that is to put you in a hyperbaric oxygen chamber, and uh, hopefully things will get better for you. That's called caisson's disease, or, or uh, I guess that's what they call a caisson's disease, the key term for that. Okay.